Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Plain Bagel. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. A lot has happened over the past couple of weeks in the banking sector, and even the past week since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. In the US, we've since seen a second bank, Signature Bank, come under FDIC receivership. The Federal Reserve, Treasury, and FDIC have since guaranteed all deposits for these defunct banks. A third regional bank, First Republic Bank, was seemingly saved by a $30 billion deposit by 11 other large US banks, done as a show of confidence to help calm the markets. The Federal Reserve opened a special lending program to help banks borrow at the par value of their treasury assets to again help calm things further. And Silicon Valley Bank's parent company, not the bank itself, has filed for bankruptcy protection. And people are trying to figure out what this all means for the US banking system, how it will impact inflation, how the Federal Reserve might change course, or if they will change course around interest rate hikes, and if this will change incentives for both depositors and banks, given that seemingly infinite insurance for systemically important banks. But none of that is what we're talking about today because the biggest news out of the financial sector is the end seemingly of Credit Suisse. If you aren't familiar with Credit Suisse, they are based in Switzerland, but they have a very large international presence specifically within investment banking. And they've been identified as a global systemically important bank in the past, meaning that if they were to fall, it would have significant implications for the global financial system. So pretty high stakes. And many were convinced that this ailing bank was on the brink of collapse given the very sketchy <laughs> actions that we had seen from it over the past few months and even over the past few years. Uh, but that all culminated into this Sunday where we saw that UBS, another Switzerland bank, a competitor to Credit Suisse, would be buying the company. And while this might actually be one of the better outcomes that we could have seen with this situation, it still convinced people having seen the fall of this international juggernaut that this is it. <laughs> this is how the world's financial system falls apart. But as with past videos, I just want to provide some context, not to underplay the real risk that we're seeing in the banking sector, but just to give context to show that this isn't necessarily a canary in the coal mine for the international banking community, because Credit Suisse was a special bank. I'll put it that way. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What exactly happened with Credit Suisse? Well, compared to US banks, which suffered most acutely as a result of a liquidity crisis, Credit Suisse uh, suffered from being a bad company, <laughs> more or less. We've actually talked about this in a past Credit Suisse video, so I don't wanna go too in depth, but just to quickly summarize, for quite some time, they've had some questionable ethics and even more questionable profits. And with scandals for this bank still coming to light as of 2023, their reputation as a financial institution has really sunk to some of the lowest lows. They did last year hire a new CEO to try and turn around the business, which included spinning off its investment banking division and even raising capital from Saudi National Bank, who took a 9.9% .9 stake in Credit Suisse, making them the largest shareholder. But back in February, the bank reported its 2022 results and they were not good. The bank had a full year loss of 7.3 billion Swiss francs, which is roughly equivalent to US dollars. And similar to banks in the US, the company reported significant withdrawals from their institution in the fourth quarter of the year, with deposits falling by 140 billion francs or roughly a third in the last quarter alone. And while this alone caused the stock to drop roughly 15% in the day that these results were announced, things got more concerning from there. Reports started to come out that in a desperate attempt to draw customers back into the bank, they were offering a 6.5% annualized rate of return on a three month term deposit, which is well above what you would get elsewhere for a safe return. On March 9th, the company delayed its annual report filing after a note from the SEC. And the following Tuesday, the company announced that there were material weaknesses found in its 2021 and 2022 financial reporting although it did claim that its financial statements were still accurate. But the markets did not believe them, and who can blame them after Silicon Valley Bank? So the stock traded down 24% to an all-time low, which was not helped by Saudi National Bank, again, the largest shareholder in this institution, announcing that they would not provide any further financial support for the bank because of regulatory restrictions. The answer is absolutely not. And so many believe that with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, Credit Suisse was the next bank on the chopping block and a bigger one at that. But following the big sell-off, Credit Suisse announced that it would be borrowing 50 billion Swiss francs or roughly 9.4% of its asset balance from the Swiss National Bank under a covered loan facility and a short-term liquidity facility both of which would be using the company's assets as collateral. Now this did help the stock a little bit as the bank now suddenly had the backing of the Switzerland Central Bank, uh, but by the end of the week, the company was still trading at a market cap of around 7 billion US dollars, 
or about 1% of the balance of their total assets. To put that market cap into perspective, this global systemically important bank was trading at roughly the same dollar valuation as World Wrestling Entertainment Inc. Talk about a smackdown. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Still, that was not the end of the stock's despair because on Sunday, as in yesterday, it was announced that UBS, which is Switzerland's biggest lender, would be merging with Credit Suisse for 3 billion Swiss francs in what many are calling a shotgun marriage given the involvement of regulators who are also extending a liquidity line for $100 billion and a loss guarantee for $9.7 billion. And interestingly, regulators completely bypassed shareholder voting rights with this deal and actually sort of violated the typical hierarchy of investments by causing bondholders of the bank's AT1 or additional tier one bonds to lose all of their money in the deal while common shareholders are still getting something for their shares, which is very atypical. But regulators have argued that this is due to the atypical circumstance of this takeover. And that's about the end of it. Not the best outcome for investors, but maybe a better outcome for pretty much everyone else, given that now we have a less scandal prone bank running this business, uh, backing deposits, and maybe perhaps we'll be able to turn the business around given the strategic initiatives that the bank was undergoing. Still, even though the deposits and operations of this bank have technically been saved, there are still concerns around the banking sector as a whole. Some people believe that central banks are simply pumping up this area to sustain it and kick the can down the road, that a lot of these banks have failing assets, that they cannot cover their obligations because they've lost too much money and have exposed themselves too much to rising interest rates uh, which have deteriorated the value of their balance sheets. But while all this is very concerning, again, I do want to highlight some points of nuance that, that really go overlooked by a lot of these recaps. Credit Suisse was seen by many as one of the slowest moving train wrecks in the world of stocks. Its stock had fallen 90% in value from 2014 to the end of 2022 before the more acute headwinds around bank runs. And while rising interest rates and the fear around bank runs did likely bring the saga to a faster close, it really is more so a story about a bad bank in a bad environment. Despite the name, Credit Suisse had lost a lot of its credit because of its questionable business practices and falling profits. And it wasn't just investors who didn't want to touch this bank. It was, to an extent, also customers who would gladly deal with another institution that didn't have this sort of reputation. And so really, if you were to ask anyone which global systemically important bank was going to be the one to fall when times got tough, there was probably going to be a lot of money on Credit Suisse. In fact, there was money on Credit Suisse failing. That's not to be flippant or to say that doesn't matter, but when people are worried about the macro factors impacting the banking sector as a whole, it doesn't really make sense to use the bank with possibly one of the worst reputations around the world as a gauge of the group's health. And the second thing I wanna highlight is that even though this bank has been taken over and did seem to be on the trajectory of failure, uh, despite their turnaround plans, it has been maintained by the company's management and others that the company did have a strong balance sheet through a lot of this. Now, I know that these days, the company telling you that they have strong liquidity and a healthy balance sheet usually means the opposite, but the company did highlight that it still had a high liquidity ratio in mid-March, and the Swiss regulatory bodies have highlighted that Credit Suisse continues to meet the liquidity requirements that come with being a global, systemically important bank. Now, I know what you're thinking, Richard, that was the same case for the US regional banks, before interest rates started to rise. And then that caused the bond portfolios of those banks to fall quite dramatically. But this is where the situation differs quite a bit. One of the big criticisms that's come out about Silicon Valley Bank is that they did not manage their interest rate risk very well. A lot of banks try to hedge at least some of their interest rate risk, meaning that, well, yes, they might own long duration bonds, meaning that bonds that are outstanding for quite a long time and are more sensitive to rising rates. They might enter other positions that have the opposite relationship to interest rates, where rising interest rates actually increase their value. And what that does is it helps to manage their interest rate exposure, something that Silicon Valley Bank, again, did not do very well. Credit Suisse, on the other hand, allegedly has fully hedged its interest rate exposure, meaning that if it were to have to sell all of its assets, or at least its investment assets, they would allegedly not have changed in value that much as a result of interest rate movements. And a big reason for this is that Credit Suisse and many European banks are subject to much more stringent regulatory requirements 
than Silicon Valley Bank was. Not only do the Basel III Accords, which were implemented after the 2008 financial crisis, broadly impose more strict requirements amongst banks in Europe, but as a global systemically important bank, Credit Suisse actually had higher standards that it had to meet in terms of leverage, in terms of liquidity, and in terms of interest rate monitoring or, or management. Meanwhile, in the US, while large banks do have to similarly follow the Basel III Accords and strict standards in that front, regional banks are not held to those same requirements. In fact, a lobby group in the US has been very successful in pushing for the deregulation of regional banking, which goes to show why a failing bank in the European system might end up with a healthier balance sheet and assets back in the value of its deposits when compared to a US regional bank, which isn't subject to those same requirements. And while US banks have been more profitable than international peers because of these deregulation moves, it seemingly has come at a cost. So hopefully that goes to explain why the Credit Suisse situation is a little different from Silicon Valley Bank and these other institutions in the US, which suffered more acutely from rising interest rates, which ironically enough are over the long term actually better <laughs> for, for banks. Banks actually tend to profit more uh, when rates are higher. But when it comes to Credit Suisse, the majority of the issues that they were facing were company specific. It's not to say that the macro didn't play a role and didn't speed up those problems. But again, they were a unique situation and shouldn't really be used as a representation of the international banking community or the health of that sector. Still a very concerning situation and a quite sad story, really. Uh, this was a bank created in 1856. It was over 160 years old. It survived the 2008 financial crisis and has now fallen after years of being plagued with scandals and poor business guidance. Feels like 2023 is really trying hard to top last year. But this isn't likely the end of the banking situation as a whole, uh, whether it be within the US or internationally. We're likely to see consequences of these actions for better or for worse. Just yesterday, we learned that central banks around the world are coordinating efforts to improve access to US dollars to help stem further bank liquidity concerns. So clearly there's an ongoing effort to combat contagion. And while one would hope that we've seen the biggest banking headlines of the year, this is all still very much a developing story. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. It does help the channel tremendously. And let me know your thoughts on the situation down below, especially if you are actually a Credit Suisse customer. Uh, given that I'm based in Canada, we don't really have the services here, although with my job, I'm quite familiar with them. Uh, so I would really love to hear your experience and whether you've seen anything on the customer level uh, with what's been developing. I hope you're doing well with everything that's going on. And as always, be safe out there.